and welcome to Myth Monsters. My name is Erin and I'll be your host for these little snack bite-sized podcasts on folklore and mythical monsters from around the world. These podcasts focus on the actual cryptids, folklore and mythic monsters from global mythology, rather than focusing on the full stories of heroes and their big adventures. I'll also be dropping in some references that they have to recent culture and where you can see these represented in modern day content so that you can learn more and get as obsessed as I am about these absolute legends of the mythological world. We're back! But apologies for the delay on our return to the airwaves. I had a lovely break, but the last week has been absolutely manic with work, so I was a bit topsy-turvy. Apologies for the delay, but it is here within the week. During my break, I turned 29, and the podcast turned 3 as well as launching the new website and merchandise. Thank you so much if you ordered. It really means the world to me and it helped me fund the podcast, so I can't thank you enough. I also played through the Lego Lord of the Rings game over the Easter Bank holiday, so I feel very fantasy-infused from all of that Tolkien. So let's pop straight back in with a really interesting monster to come back to. We're going down under this week for this cryptid, And realistically, is it even a cryptid? That is the question with the thylacine, so let's jump straight back in. The thylacine is described as a marsupial, which as we know are pouched animals like kangaroos, wallabies, koalas and opossums for example. They're around the same size as a large dog or even a large wolf, with a beige coat of fur but at the back end of them, there are black stripes resembling those of a tiger pattern going all the way down to its long tail. They have a thin, elongated snout with sharp canine teeth and generally get around on all four legs, much like a dog would. They also had short, rounded ears and a strange, straight paw print with all of the pads showing almost like a straight line. Because of this, they were actually unable to run very fast as they had a slightly awkward gait to them, but they were able to frighten prey from a distance due to their guttural barks and whining cries. They were known to be able to extend their jaws to a much wider extent than any other canine, to an 80 degree angle, which is pretty mad. They were though an ambush nocturnal predator, and would stalk prey such as wild birds, fish and small mammals such as echidnas, wallabies, bandicoots and possums, so they were definitely not a threat to humans. The only thing that would give them away would be a pungent smell, described as a faint, clean animal odour, which is seen in similar creatures such as Tasmanian devils. Because of their marsupial nature, Both genders had a pouch, which the females used for rearing their young, which were born live within it like joeys, which we now know within kangaroos, and they lived with a lifespan of around five to seven years. They would live in large family packs, with a male and female leading, and males would generally protect the familial pack. The males also had pouches, but would use them to protect their external reproductive system, and it honestly sounds like something all male species would benefit from. And speaking of which, humans were the biggest risk to thylacines, as they would often hunt livestock such as sheep, and so farmers would be encouraged to shoot and kill thylacines. Unfortunately, they didn't have any extraordinary powers, they were just mammals at the end of the day, so they were quite easily taken down by a farmer's shotgun. These monsters were also known as Tasmanian tigers because of their stripes and because of where they're from. They were most found on the oceanic island of Tasmania, which is just off of Australia and technically a part of it. And they were also found on the mainland of Australia, but also on the island of New Guinea which is one of the Melanesian islands in the Oceania continent. They generally prefer dry eucalyptus forests, wetlands and grasslands in the mainland. However, in Tasmania, 
They lived in woodlands and coastal heaths, where they would live in around 40 to 80 kilometer spaces in those packs and familial units. However, interestingly, their etymology is not at all Australian. Whilst thylacine sounds great in an Aussie accent, the word actually comes from the Greek word thylakos, meaning pouch, and een, meaning pertaining to. I also really hope you appreciated my Aussie accent there. I think it's quite good. But generally, their etymology is a little bit boring in the sense that I've got two root words, and that's about it. But before we get into history, I need to put you out of your misery. If you know anything about this monster, and as I said, they didn't have any mystical powers. And the reason this monster is so interesting, and actually really difficult to discuss in a myth monster context, is because it's a fact that the thylacine did actually exist. Yes, they are actually very real creatures that we have very real actual pictures and classifications on. They were real. So, you must be asking, why am I discussing this then? Well, unfortunately, thylacines no longer exist. They were hunted into extinction by us in the 1930s, which is incredibly sad, but again, that doesn't make sense as to why we're talking about them. We don't talk about the dodo on this podcast, but we know they did once exist. Well, this is because thylacines are technically a cryptid, because there have been multiple sightings of them since their declared extinction, which has moved them into a cryptid space. A cryptid is technically defined as something that is believed to exist, but we have no evidence of. The thylacine fits into this theory right now because it doesn't exist anymore, and sightings fuel belief that it does, making it a cryptid. Super interesting, right? It's kind of backwards as to how we look at cryptids like Mothman, Bigfoot, that we never had any recorded actual living existence of them, and we're trying to force them into existence through cryptozoology. However, this one, we're actually trying to bring back, and it makes it so much more interesting from a myth monster's perspective. But let's go back to the beginning. The thylacine were discovered a very, very long time ago in cave paintings in Australia, dating back to at least 1000 BC. However, fossils of them actually show that they were around about 1.7 million years ago, and they were originally small, insect-eating mammals who fit more alongside stuff like flying foxes than dogs. Through evolution, though, throughout the centuries, they became larger mammals to survive to these wolf-sized canines that we think of now when we think of thylacines. By the time settlers appeared in Australia, in the early 1600s, the thylacine had already been wiped out on the mainland and in New Guinea, so it was only ever seen in Tasmania when they settled there in 1642. Bear in mind, really important, there were people there before the European settlers, and Australian history does not begin when the Europeans came over. However, because of the tribal nature of the Aboriginal culture, we don't know much about them before this point in history, so the European settlement is a kind of bouncing pad. The thylacine was officially discovered by Europeans in 1792 by French explorer Jacques Lebardier, who called them a tiger cat and saying that they have claws like a tiger. The first proper scientific study of them happened in 1808, five years after the first full settlement on Tasmania, and they were placed among the opossum family, calling it the dog-headed opossum. They were then moved to the Darassus genus family, which mostly features small mammals, until they were formally given their own genus in 1824, called the Thylacinus. Just in case you didn't know, a genus family is the type of animal, and we kind of put those into little classifications rather than just putting everyone under the umbrella term of mammal, for example. 
that then split into their separate little types and categories so that we can go the thylacine has 12 different species within it and so they have this genus family of thylacinus. That's what I mean by that. Now their closest living relative currently is actually the Tasmanian devil and I know what we're all thinking or at least my 90s and 80s babies are all thinking. They don't look like Taz from Looney Tunes, I'm so sorry to say. These are small mammals with very, very dark fur and rodent-like faces. However, they are around the size of wombats and possums. I actually think they're really cute, but I think I'm in the minority. I do have to go more into the extinction event very sadly, and this happened because Australia is generally not very leafy in the first place for their habitats, but as well as this, the dingo was introduced to Australia around 3,200 years ago. These wild dogs are omnivores, as well as being much more versatile in their hunting habits, outsmarting the thylacine and taking more and more of their prey. Unfortunately though, the main factor within the 18 to 1900s was humankind taking valuable resources from the native species, massively changing the climate and realistically terraforming the land for human use. As well as this, we also hunted them voraciously due to them eating our livestock. But in scientific means, it's actually considered that climate change was the biggest contributor to their death, which is so sad to think of even back then in the 1900s having such an impact. They did survive until the 1930s in Tasmania though, but they did have active bounties on their heads from farmers up until 1909, with both the government and private companies paying up to a pound, which was a lot of money, per thylacine. By the 1920s, it was immensely rare to see a thylacine, and many zoos actually started to panic and pick up as many as they possibly could. But the damage was done, and unfortunately with a captivity lifespan of only nine years, the last wild thylacine was shot in 1930, and the last thylacine in captivity, a female, then passed away on the 7th of September 1936 in Hobart Zoo in Tasmania, ending the species. There was even a hoax made up about this incident in 1968, that it was actually a male specimen called Benjamin who was the last one, and it was neglected by volunteer zookeepers and died that way. But this was found not to be true. However, there were records of neglect to thylacines in captivity because they were considered a pest, just not to the last one, or the endling as we would call the very last of the species. Unfortunately, Australia acted way too late and called for conservation on the thylacine on the 10th of July 1936, which was 59 days before the death of the very last one. The species was not declared as extinct until 1982, as the rule is, is that they can only be declared 50 years after the passing of the last known specimen. However, this brings us to the cryptid bit and where we kind of come in as the podcast. There were at least 3,800 reported sightings of this creature all through the 20th and 21st centuries, up until the present day, with interest in the creature still astronomically high. The first launched investigations into sightings across Australia and Tasmania were in 1967 and 1973 by zoologist Jeremy Griffith. He searched through the Tasmanian west coast extensively but found nothing. In 1983, American Ted Turner, who founded the CNN network, offered $100,000 for proof of thylacine's continued existence and was followed by an Australian news magazine offering $1.25 million in 2005. However, neither produced any evidence. There's actually an ongoing offer for $1.75 million for proof if you fancy hunting through 
the snake and spider riddled Australian outback for a thylacine. Good luck if you do! There have been several pictures and incidents of supposed thylacines throughout the last 50 years, including in 1973, Gary and Liz Doyle shot 10 seconds of an unidentified animal running across a South Australian road. However, the footage was way too unclear and experts could do nothing about it. In 1982, Hans Narding, a researcher, saw a thylacine for three minutes during the night at a site in Tasmania and actually kicked off a huge government search. Unfortunately, they found nothing, but it was worth it. In 1985, Aboriginal Kevin Cameron had five photographs which appeared to show a digging thylacine in Western Australia. In 1995, a wildlife officer reported seeing a thylacine in northeastern Tasmania in the early hours of the morning. And in 1997, it was reported that locals and missionaries in New Guinea had seen thylacines. The locals had apparently known about them for a load of time, but had not made any official reports. However, when investigated, they couldn't find any evidence of them. In 2005, Klaus Emmerichs, a German tourist, claimed to have taken photos of a thylacine that he saw in Tasmania, but they were considered inconclusive. Now, I think this one's the most interesting In 2012, two brothers uncovered skeletal remains of what they believed to be a thylacine. The bones were taken back to zoologists, and they couldn't compare them to any known animal. But they were eventually given up and concluded as dog bones. But the brothers didn't give up, and actually these bones are now considered a mystery. In 2017, whilst filming a sunset in the outback, A man saw what he believed to be a thylacine, and this was followed by a government search over the next few days, but unfortunately nothing was found. This is actually the last recorded search, but considering it was 2017, it's actually considerably recent. And to follow that, even better news, and that's the plans to clone a thylacine that were made by the Australian Museum in 1999. In late 2002, scientists were able to extract DNA from a thylacine pup that had been preserved. However, this all came crashing down three years later in 2005 when it failed after finding that the DNA was too badly degraded. But in 2008, at the University of Texas, scientists were able to reconstruct a bone gene which was from an 100-year-old thylacine tissue sample from loads of different museums. Samples of the same bone gene were injected into a mouse embryo, and it came back with really surprising results. In 2013, there were plans to de-extinct many extinct animals, and the thylacine is amongst the ones that they want to do. And in 2022, they started to recreate the thylacine's closest relative, the fat-tailed dunnart, in a cloning lab and so we've only got really good things going ahead. Now, I will save the mythical and real-life comparisons this week because of the circumstances around this one. However, we can still talk about the cultural impact, and this is still really massive in Australia and Tasmania. The thylacine is used as a symbol of Tasmania, used in their coat of arms and for the logo of their government as well as on license plates, and it is generally considered a cultural icon. They are also considered within Aboriginal culture, and it's said that Aboriginals believe that bad weather was caused by a thylacine carcass being left exposed on the ground instead of being covered by a small shelter or buried. They also have a myth around thylacines, that a thylacine pup saved Palana a spirit boy from an attack by a giant kangaroo. Palana marked the pup's back with ochre as a mark of its bravery, giving thylacines their trademark stripes. There's also a constellation, Wurrawana Karina, near Gemini, and that is created as a commemoration of this mythic act of bravery. And in theory, 
thylacines are written into the stars. Now, on to modern media. There's not really much in regards to this monster, and it's quite hard to find a matching trope, so I've popped in some other Australian monster bits in here to stick with the theme. For art, I'd actually really recommend having a look at John Gold's illustrations of the thylacines from his book, The Mammals of Australia for Portrait Art, but otherwise, have a look at the actual photos of the real ones, and the independent art made from this, but have a look at the pictures, they're really cute. In movies we have The Hunter, Extinct, Godzilla King of Monsters, Frog Dreaming, Carnifex, Bunyip Moon, and Scooby-Doo and the Legend of the Vampire. For TV we have The Peripheral, Tasmania, Alexander Bunyip, Charmed, Danger 5, Family Guy, Mona the Vampire, The Secret Saturdays, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, The Wild Thornberries, Looney Tunes, and Shape Shape Shape. In video games we have one such as Far Cry 3, Crash Bandicoot, Ty the Tasmanian Tiger, Valorant, The Path of Exile, RuneScape, Final Fantasy X, Chrono Cross, The Adventures of Down Under Dan, and Escape Velocity. My book recommendations this week, I have many. It's for The Hunter by Julia Lee for a fictional novel about hunting down the last thylacine, which was made into the film with Willem Dafoe mentioned in the movie section, or Platypus Matters, The Extraordinary Story of Australian Mammals by Jack Ashby for some more information on Australian animals, which I bought because I thought it sounded really interesting. For folklore though, there are books written on the thylacine and I'd recommend Tasmanian Tiger, The Tragic Story of the Thylacine by David Owen or Extinct, The Story of Life on Earth, Thylacine by Ben Garrard for this monster specifically. But now it's time for Do I think they existed? This is probably the easiest answer I will ever ever give to this question and of course I believe they existed because it did. The real question here is do I believe they still exist and have come back from the brink of extinction and the answer to that is unfortunately I don't think so. That is because good friends bringing back animals from the brink of extinction is so hard let alone ones that died off in the 1930s. I know that they're trying to bring them back and that the Tasmanian Devil is a close comparison, but let's be real, the sightings are most likely something like dingoes, and it's really sad that they were hunted into extinction, and I'm glad that they are a good candidate for cloning once we have the full technology to do so. It's also nice that we'd be adding back another marsupial to Australia, and the rest of Oceania. I really do like that Australia is just the land of these types of animals, and who doesn't love kangaroos and wallabies? They're so cute! I really like the thylacine though, and I love that this monster has become a cryptid through trying to bring it back into existence, which is usually the opposite of what we see with cryptids. So I'm glad that people are happy that an extinct animal might be coming back. It fills me with joy. And actually, reading out all of the details of its extinction made me really sad, so it brings me a little bit of happiness to know that people want to bring it back. But what do you think? Does the thylacine still roam about in Tasmania and Australia? Let me know on Twitter, I would love to know what you think. It's a great monster to come back to, and actually it fits really well into April Fool's Week, I suppose because they're not really a myth monster, but they fit enough into the category and I like them, so that's that. Next week, we're heading on over to a new part of the US and technically a whole new folklore that we've not touched on yet, and that's Cajun and Louisianan folklore for a listener's suggestion of the terrifying Rougerou. Thank you, Jeremy, and for your wife for sending this one in and I hope you're prepared to trawl through the bayou for this one next Thursday. For now though, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give it a rating on the service you are listening on, 
I've got the Twitter for any questions or suggestions on what monsters to cover next, and I'd love to hear from you. The social media handles for TikTok, YouTube, Threads, and Instagram are Myth Monsters Podcast, and the Twitter is Myth Monsters Pod. But all of our content can be found at MythMonsters.co.uk, along with all of our cool merchandise. And you can also find us on Good Pods, Buy Me a Coffee, and Patreon if you want to help me fund the podcast too. Come join the fun though, share this with your pals, they might love me as much as you do. But for now, stay spooky, and I'll see you later, babes.